Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. Catch us live weekdays at 7 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay or Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business App. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Now, our Michael McKee, an important conversation with the president of the Boston Fed, Susan Collins. I'm Michael McKee, the international economics and policy correspondent for Bloomberg. And we are at the Boston Federal Reserve Bank today. They're holding their 68th annual economics conference. And we're joined by the president of the Boston Fed, Susan Collins. Thank you very much for being with us today. Delighted to be here. Thanks for being at the Boston Fed. Uh, it's great. It, it, we tell everybody it's a beautiful day, but it's 39 degrees. So winter has finally hit here. <laughs> Seasons are wonderful. So speaking of winter, December 18th, you have another Fed meeting. And at this point, there seem to be some questions about whether or not the Fed will be cutting rates again, because this week we got some firm inflation news. Uh, retail sales were OK, but not particularly strong. Uh, at this point, are you thinking that we should see a cut or is it better to pause and wait? So I think it's important to say there's no preset path. Uh, I do see rates as still in the restrictive range, which means that over time some amount of easing will be appropriate. But, you know, the economy is in a very good place right now. And uh, inflation's coming back down to target. The labor markets are healthy. We're seeing solid growth. The goal of policy is really to sustain that healthy set of conditions, recognizing, you know, there are risks on both sides. And so I think we're well positioned. I certainly wouldn't take uh, another uh, ease in December off the table. But again, we're not on a preset path. And so we'll have to look carefully at the data and see what makes sense when we get to December 18th. Well, the data this week showed inflation a little bit stronger than it had been in the CPI and the PPI. And those who do the nerdy calculations for the PCE say we're going to see the same thing. Uh, should you keep your foot on the brake a little more then? Because inflation is not back down to your target. So, you know, I don't focus too much on any one data point. I think it's really important to look holistically. And when I do that, what I see is that, first of all, inflation has come down significantly. Um, I focus on the, uh, you know, a uh, couple of month averages. And um, if you take food, energy, and in particular shelter out, the rest of inflation has actually been in the range consistent with the 2%, exactly what we'd like to see. What's really still elevated is shelter, and that is taking time to come back down, and a lot of that really reflects shocks from the past. I'm not seeing evidence of new price pressures, and so I think it's important to stay the course, but that... Uh, analysis of the data is part of why I thought it was really appropriate for us to begin easing in September and uh, to be in uh, you know an environment where we are really looking over time methodically perhaps patiently to be normalizing policy to maintain those healthy conditions that I talked about a moment ago well let's look at the other side of the mandate employment uh, we had a very strong employment report, and then we had a very weak employment report, uh, granted, affected by hurricanes and strikes. So what's your judgment of where the labor market is when you look holistically at all of the yeah, labor yeah. data? So again, when I look at all of the data, and you're absolutely right, there have been some stronger readings, there have been some readings over time that were a bit weaker, and there are a lot of special factors. So looking at uh, averages over time, looking at the range of information, what I see is a labor market that looks similar to uh, conditions that we've considered full employment. So in terms of job openings and quit rates and the fact that uh, wage growth has been coming down and given the high productivity we've seen is consistent with um, the uh, move back down to 2% inflation and staying there. Um, and unemployment has stayed in a range that is near 4%, low by historical standards, so yes, higher than, than a year ago. So all of that to me says healthy labor market conditions, things to watch carefully, uh, and don't focus too much on any one piece of data, 
we have to look at the whole picture. All right, healthy labor market. Inflation's coming down, even if it's stalled a little bit, but it's in the twos. And the economy is stronger than people had forecast. So do you agree with Chairman Powell in saying there is nothing telling you you have to, ra you have to cut rates very quickly? So I think that, uh, so I don't, I agree that I don't see a big urgency at the same time. I do think that preserving those healthy conditions, right? I mean, that's what our mandate really is from Congress. Price stability and maximum employment sustained over time, not just at some point in time. And so, uh, as I said before, I do see uh, financial, uh, uh, the policy stance is being in a restrictive place. And over time, normalizing that, I think, is going to be important. But we're well positioned to be really uh, careful in assessing the data and making decisions about the pace, about the timing. Uh, and so that, you know, that's how I think about that. Let me uh, ask about the elephant in the room, and that is the new president-elect of the United States. His policies have not been fleshed out Chairman Powell's made it clear you don't know exactly what's going to happen. But uh, do you expect that something in whatever his fiscal plans are will affect the economy and you will have to take another look, say, at what your economic projections are and what the dot plot projections are for 2025? You know, as we get information about the economy, certainly that includes about fiscal policy, um, of course it's really important to factor that in. And there are lots of things we look at. Fiscal policy is certainly one of them. But I don't want to speculate on what policies that you know haven't been enacted or implemented might look like. Well, do you think that tariffs as an economic uh, concept add to inflation? Uh, they can. And again, we would have to see if there are tariffs that are uh, implemented uh, more about the specifics and the dynamics for those. Now, if there's a fiscal uh, impulse in whatever the president-elect chooses to do, is the economy growing too fast for that right now? Would that be a danger, a worry? So again, I think there are lots of things that determine how the economy evolves and grows over time. Fiscal policy is certainly one of them and certainly does have an impact on that and we'd have to factor that in and look through that. Um, you know, I, I, I do think, and uh, Chair Powell has, has also said this, that you know, fiscal policy at the moment is on a path that's not sustainable. Um, but again, we, when we make our policy decisions to focus on our mandate from Congress, it's really based on the data that we have available and the analyses and the assessments that we can do on that basis. As far as I know, uh, President-elect Trump has never threatened to fire you, uh, but uh, I want to ask, what is, in your mind, the relationship between the Federal Reserve and the executive branch? So what I would say is that the Fed um, is structured by Congress as uh, an independent body and that that is important in terms of the ability for us to do our job well. There's a lot of analysis that shows that independent central banks are more effective at keeping inflation low and stable. And, and we have really seen how important it is to keep inflation low and stable in terms of the, the impact, the, the higher prices mm -hmm. past inflation have had. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I think that is a very good structure to enable us to do our jobs well. So and the things that come across social media are basically just noise in the background to you as a policymaker. I am very focused on doing my job, and there is more than enough to keep me very focused and very busy. Now, uh, the people I want, you can't see them, I can see them out there, all the traders on their knees going, tell us when you're going to do this sort of thing. Uh, can we basically say because of the potential changes that are coming and the data that we have seen that the dot plot for 2025 and the SEP for 2025, those are kind of out the window now and uh, we should really wait until December or even later to get a good idea of where you think you're going to be and the economy is going to be? Well, things I think always evolve and so in about a month or so we will have a new SEP and information from all of the policymakers about what they think. Uh, and so I think it's always true that you know, uh, in the middle of the, the SEP information, um, you don't want to take too much from what 
uh, might have been written down, penciled in, I would say, uh, a number of weeks earlier. A lot of the data evolves. What are the people who in these tall buildings around us, all the, the corporate leaders in your district, telling you about how they see the economy going forward and their plans? Yeah, and I appreciate you asking about that. I think um, one of the really important things that I do, that my colleagues do, is talk to people across the economy in lots of different sectors. So being out and about throughout New England. And what I'm hearing is pretty consistent with what I said at the outset, that uh, people are cautiously optimistic. They see an economy that seems resilient. Labor markets have uh, moved into much more normal conditions relative to the kind of unsustainable, more overheated conditions from a year or more ago. And uh, the price pressures really have abated considerably. So that's all very consistent. But of course, you know, the aggregate data masks a range of different specifics across individual firms and sectors and regions. And it's really, I think, helpful to hear all of that and pull the qualitative information together with the statistics. One last question uh, at your conference. Uh, it's on financial technology this year, and the Boston Fed's been in the middle of financial technology. Yes. And just coincidentally, coming up at the top of the hour, we have our Bloomberg Technology Show. Perfect. So let me ask you, uh, a lot of tech talk over the last five, six, seven years has been tech talk. How fast are we going to see some sort of impact on the average person from uh, new payment systems. I realize you have Fed now in place, but how fast are people going to say, hey, this is something different? And are we going to see any kind of digital currency adoption, whether it's private or government, in the next few years? So, you know, the, uh, the impacts of technology have many, many dimensions, and I think we're already seeing some impacts in terms of the roles that fintech are playing across our economy in different ways. And the, the conference today and tomorrow is intended to really bring experts together who have knowledge and done analysis from different vantage points to see, um, as we put together the things we know, uh, what are some of the things we don't know and need to know better? And so what we're really focusing on is a number of different themes, including uh, financial inclusion. Um, what are some of the implications of the innovations for access to financial services? And then also, what are some of the implications of technological innovation for the transmission of monetary policy, for um, our supervision and regulation of financial institutions and also for financial stability. So thinking about both the opportunities and the risks. And I think we are already seeing some of those implications, but it's still unfolding, it's complicated, and it's moving pretty quickly. So that's what we're trying to better understand. And again, we're delighted that you're all here while we're in the midst of a conference on an important topic. <laughs> well, thank you for having us. Susan Collins, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. We'll send it back to you now. All right, Michael McKee, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Michael McKee speaking with Boston Fed President Susan Collins here in Boston. You're listening to the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. On that commute this morning, it's very important on radio, on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, to talk to the number one chart guy in the world. It really works on radio. Maybe it works better on YouTube, but we're going to be chart-free this morning with Yuri and Timmer. The title is Director Global Macro at Fidelity Management, and you can see the miracle of this work on LinkedIn, where he's very, very visible. Yuri and Timmer joins us now as he gets ready for the charts of the weekend. How do you amend your charts when there was a news bulletin yesterday, the Bloomberg headline, that there's $7 trillion in cash laying out there. How does that affect Will Danoff? How does that affect Uri and Timmer? Well, so that's that's cash sitting in you know, money market accounts. Of course, we are the leading provider of money markets, so we're, we're intimately involved with that, with that cash. But my sense always has been that 
a lot of that cash um, it did not flee the stock market uh, in a flight to quality, which is kind of typically what you would expect. And then when uh, when people feel more comfortable, they bring the cash back in. Right. In this case, the cash came out of the banks uh, during the the regional bank crisis, you know, a few years ago, uh, when banks, you know, still are paying half a percent on deposits, and they were then, and the Fed was raising rates and uh, providing alternatives. So I don't quite see this as a uh, powder keg of cash waiting to chase stocks. And, right. and the metric I look at is money market fund assets, assets as a percentage of the market cap in the stock market. And there, it's more in it's line. It's more normal. It's more normal. Yeah. So the <clears throat> money came out of the banks. My sense is it eventually will go back in the banks, but not necessarily stock. We need to go into the crown jewel secrets of fidelity. And uh, Abby, thank you so much for listening this morning and giving us access to Mr. Uh, uh, Timmer. I'm going to cut to the chase. What's the elasticity of yield in money market flows? If yields come down two decimal points or one decimal point or a big figure, when does Paul get out of his money market funds? <laughs> well, I, I I think the Fed is not going to cut as much as uh, many people have thought and continue to think. So maybe it goes to four. Uh, it's at four and five eighths. If that's the case, money market yields stay around four or so. And I don't think that is going to create a tsunami you know, out of cash into other assets, whether it's bonds or, or equities. Um, so I, I don't think we're going to have another sort of ZERP era where we go to zero or one and that mon- and risk premium in the bond market gets suppressed and then that money flees into the into the risk market. Uh, so I, I, I don't think we're going to get there, but it would be it, it would it would take you know more than what we've seen so far yeah. for sure. You're in. What do you make of the uh, move we've seen in financial markets uh, since the election? Big move up uh, stocks, uh, yields pushing higher, dollar stronger, Bitcoin at ninety thousand per token. What do you make of all that? Yeah. So so the markets um, are always in price discovery mode, right? Sometimes the new information comes in gradually, slowly. A company reports earnings, the stock price adjusts. And sometimes the information comes in all at once, as we had with the election, right? You can tell that people were sitting on their hands. You know, it was supposedly too close to call, so nothing really got done. And the market's brutally efficient in discounting new information. And so on November 6th, it had a lot of new information to discount, um, and that's what it did, and that's what, what price discovery is. And so the red wave trade, right, small caps, um, less Fed uh, cuts, return of the term right. premium, um, rotation into financials, energy, industrial, so broadening, um, that, that, is the, right. that is the trade. And I think in 2016, that trade was pretty much sort of done by December, right? So it happens very quickly. It's not like this is like right. the, the first bat of the first inning. Like it, it get, It's done instantaneously. You have portfolios at Fidelity that are over 50% in their top 10 stocks, and they're very mag 70, et cetera, et cetera. What do you see in your chart work on the flows? Luis Yamato would say the distributions in and out of mag 7 right now. Are we selling? Are we buying? What are we doing? Well, I think the good news for the MAG-7 <clears throat> is that they're not that expensive, right? I, th- I take a broader brush. I look at the Nifty 50, the top 50 stocks, just because I have a data set that sure. goes all the way back to the 60s. and 1860. Yeah, <laughs> and during the early 70s, the original Nifty 50, and the late 90s, the dot-com era, those 50 stocks were trading at twice the valuation multiple as the bottom 450. Today, the top 50 are trading at a 25% premium. So you can't call it a bubble if the valuation is not extreme. The price movements have been extreme, but not the valuation. So what we've seen over the past few months, really since the Fed started cutting rates, is that this has been a bullish broadening. So the market has broadened. 80% of stocks are above the 200-day moving average, but it's not happening at the expense of the of the mega growers and in that sense this cycle in a way has kind of gone in reverse it's like a benjamin button cycle where <laughs> you know usually a bull market starts very broad right because the the the, the junky low price stocks that got right. obliterated in the bear market come bouncing back and then as the cycle matures it gets more narrow and the the blue chips are left standing at the end and you get those breadth divergences 
this time it's been the opposite. It started with the MAG-7, and then <clears throat> even during the rate-hiking cycle, those were the safe stocks to be in because they were immune to the Fed because they had so much cash. And now they're, they're holding their absolute performance, but the market has broadened really since a year ago. Um, and so it's kind of the best that you can hope for, like a more... A more disorderly version of that would be that the the MAG-7 or the Nifty 50 um, decline because money is moving from those stocks to the broader market. Then the index, the S&P, would have trouble staying up just because of the weight of those seven stocks. But we're not seeing that yet. Your title is Director of Global Macro. Where do you see the U.S. versus non-U.S. right now? Well, so U.S. you know um, excellence you know has been in place uh, for a decade, and it's interesting you know because we're always debating you know do we go outside the U.S. I mean the U.S. trading at 22, ex-U.S. is trading at 15 PE, so the U.S. is 60 percent more expensive than the rest of the the world, whether it's EM or IFA, you know Japan, Europe. Um, but you need a catalyst, right? Evaluation is not alone. You need relative earnings. Like if you go across the street and, and you're in the halls of, of Fidelity, the mantra is price follows earnings. And relative price or relative performance follows relative earnings. And so that is missing with between the U.S. and the rest of the world because U.S. earnings okay. continue to dominate. Price follows earnings. Sounds like Bettina Dalton, 1980. Okay, let's go there. I got an election. I got a belief nominal GDP is going to pop. Do you, within the research of the fundamental animals at Fidelity and what you're doing with charts, agree that nominal is going to pop, revenues are going to pop, and thus earnings will sustain? Yes. So we're one year into an earnings cycle. Trail earnings are up 8% this year. Forward earnings are up about uh, 12 or so. Uh, the expectation is that earnings will continue to grow next year. And if we do get right. this nominal GDP pop and earnings are a nominal thing, right. uh, the earnings cycle can continue. But the thing I worry about is the return of the of the Fed model. You know, back in the Greenspanian days of the 80s, um, bond yields kind of, you know, are causing indigestion again, the bond right. vigilantes. And we've seen that now repeatedly over the last few years. And I think that is a risk for 2025. Okay. You're going to be in New York soon? I will be. Please, and, you've got to come in because we've got to talk about Babson, and okay. the, the global ranking they just yeah. got. Yes. And while, while you have me on the air, um, I don't know what your schedule is, but I would be like to invite you to come look at our chart room after this show or the whole, after this your is time. like the vatican folks i'm going to tear up <laughs> you've got the golf stream right oh sure you can go Absolutely. over i you're in i don't think i can do it i think i have to race to the airport okay i'm sorry but paul's got the golf next stream. <laughs> so we'll do it next time yeah. yuri and timmer thank you so much with fidelity there and we're efforting a number of their managers as well to talk about this spectacular year that we've seen in the markets this is the bloomberg surveillance podcast Listen live each weekday starting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Joining us now, <laughs> uh, Gautam Makunda of Yale University with other parchment along the Charles River as well. He's given us such good help here uh, with the election. I want to talk, and this is a fancy technology seminar. Everybody here knows how to use a uh, a cell phone, a computer. They're, they're back. They're using Fortran here at the Boston. Are they? Fed. Okay. Yeah, it's, 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 but That's how they got them. As simple as this is it Luddite America, where there's a huge in our polarization. There's a huge body of people that just aren't. In taking advantage of technology and are almost anti-technology. I mean, I think. Certainly, there's a huge anti-technology f f push, and, but it's striking that some of the most elite pro-tech people in the world are well, That's on, my second are, question. Are Let's both sides yeah. I got Elon Musk as part of the new administration. He defines entrepreneurship and technology, and you got I got partially a Luddite America. Yeah, so you have sort of this icon of entrepreneurship technology, Elon Musk, and you also have RFK Jr., possibly the most anti-science person in America. And apparently they're going to be serving in the same administration. So it's quite a contrast. And technology shocks, like China shocks, have had big impacts on the labor market. We know that. They're, they seem to be affecting people in lots of different ways. We've seen the decrease in manufacturing, employment, lots of things. And all of these things added up to create a level of social ferment in this country that we're just starting to see the implications of. But the flip side of that is 
a lot of parties that have won landslide that will won big elections. And this was a decisive victory by the Republicans, but not a landslide. Right. It didn't look anything like 2008, for example. Um, have interpreted that as gigantic sweeping mandates for all of their policies and found out that actually people were voting on one issue. And that was, and in this case, almost certainly inflation. And they've then sort of leaned into, they sort of over-interpreted their victory. How much of this anti-technology thing that you're talking about is a product of people starting to over-interpret the victory? And a, a, it's, we don't know yet, but it's pretty striking when we see this. And, and Paul, you see this with the technology mm -hmm. reports we see, like Apple or Microsoft sure. or NVIDIA. Yep. It's like two planets. It is. It's just extraordinary. Gautam, I mean, we're these... Cabinet picture coming fast and furious uh, from President-elect Trump and his uh, campaign. What's your takeaway so far? So in the first century AD, the mad Roman emperor Caligula decided to make his horse Incitatus a consul of Rome. <laughs> that horse was still a better pick than Matt Gates for attorney general. <laughs> um, you know, you sort of see Republicans, re re Democrats we expect recoil, but you can see Republicans recoiling that in general, one does not expect that the attorney general's closest contact with the Justice Department before they get the job is being investigated by the Justice Department for sex trafficking. Like, that seems out of the ordinary. So uh, talk to us the role that Congress will play in the confirmation process for some of these uh, uh, appointees. As large as they choose it to be. Um, I think of the set of appointees, they're the sort of the normal appointees, Bartum, uh, Marco Rubio, who are going to get even, the, most Democrats will vote. Just you know, say thank God we got him and in fine. Um, Stefanik at the UN will probably get something similar like that. Um, but the flip side is clearly Democrats are going to go insane over the idea of the the sort of Hegseth, Tulsi Gabbard at DNI. That's the one that people in the internet, and I'll say in the in the in the national security community, people are simply going insane. Like they don't even know how to process that prospect. Um, you know. RFK Jr. at HHS. I don't. I think people don't quite realize. You know, HHS has a tr budget of almost two trillion dollars. So the scale of what we're talking wow. about, him there, is just unimaginable. Um, and this is someone who, when he was running for president, proposed that one of the things he wanted to do was just stop all research and development on new drugs. So I mean, you know, four years, no R and D in the in the life sciences. I think people could probably ob object to that. So what's the realistic view in Washington? I'm um, just about. To what extent will some of these Republican senators, in effect, go against their president by blocking some of these appointees? I, I think people are starting to think not that much. Um, it wouldn't shock me if Gates doesn't get confirmed just because he's made so many enemies mm -hmm. in the Congress that they might there'll be a reaction. But the others, I think the betting is that the level of patronage that Trump has and the level of sway he has over the party, he ran ahead of all of these people, right? He got more votes than most of these people. Mm -hmm. um, in, in Michigan, the Democrats held the Senate seat because tens of thousands of people came in, voted for Donald Trump, and left the rest of the ballot blank. <clears throat> yep. Uh, and so... And so it, yeah. maybe, I mean, if you're a Trump supporter, I think a lot of those uh, folks felt like he's doing exactly what we wanted him to do, which is to be un unconventional... Uh, you know, kind of drain the swamp, to use a term from the past uh, yeah. cycle. Um, maybe there is public support for this. So I, I think there is certainly a base of Trump supporters for whom this this is exactly what they wanted. And this is this is sort of they're extremely enthusiastic about that. But my strong suspicion is that base is not 50 percent of the country and it's not anything close to 50 percent of the country. And there are a lot of people who probably did not vote to find out that, right. you know, we're not going to be inventing new vaccines for the next few years. And let's note, it's not just a four-year problem, right? When you eliminate these capabilities, you can't wave a magic wand and bring them back. Right. It takes generations to build the sort of scientific establishment that we have and that is now at risk. This is going to be in your lectures at Yale. It is Tom Nichols of Naval War College, all of his work. Three times in the last two days, people have sent me Death of Expertise. Tom Nichols' book, that I interviewed him for it years ago, The Death of Expertise is it as grim now as it's ever been? Uh, Tom's great, and I, I would say it might be grimmer than even than I think that even he expected. Um, you know, when going into the election, you would talk to Democrats and Republicans, and my, Democrats, even the ones the ones who were really scared, were, would talk about these sorts of appointments. And you know, you'd say like, "What are the odds <clears throat> you'd get the worst case scenario?" Yeah. And Republicans would say, "Well, you know, we'll just get have a normal Trump, a normal Republican administration with a guy who makes sense mean tweets." 
So when you think about the, the spectrum of where people thought they were going to end up, these appointments are sort of the worst fears of mm-hmm. Democrats, except not even, even that, nobody saw it in Matt Gates coming. Um, so, yeah, there's a profound death of expertise problem, but let's back out from that. I think we, we all as a society just haven't thought all through. Right. Let's back up for a second. A lot of this is about new communication technologies. We talk about social media, things like that, which make the world more transparent. So we see that the experts were never as great as they thought they as we thought they were, and their failures. That doesn't mean they're useless. There's, there can be right. mistakes. When the printing press was invented, right? The big foreign, the big consequence of that that historians go back is they say the Thirty Years' War, the worst war in European right. history right. that killed a third of the population of Germany, was directly driven by the invention of the printing press. We're going to continue this discussion in New York, as I'm sure we will, with Gautam Akunda. He's with Yale uh, University here. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal. Adair Morris, conference keynote speaker and professor at UC Berkeley's uh, Business School. Adair, thanks so much for joining us here. You're a keynote speaker here today. What are you going to be talking about? I'm going to be talking about AI and the use in, in credit, so thinking about not just in understanding AI in terms of deploying and getting better, better, precise underwriting and knowing people's risk and this sort of stuff. But there's a general landscape of using AI for all kinds of provision of of lending to people. And then there's some red flags, right? And so kind of putting the landscape out there, we need to think about both sides. We need to inform not just policymakers, we're here at the Fed, but but also the providers, right? So they can think about things that, that they need to step up and, and understand. We were back, last time I was up here in Boston, we were doing some work with the Boston Consulting Group, and they were, they were saying as they talk to their clients across all industries about the use of AI, they want to get a commitment that they will do it in, a, in the correct way. In a, you know, and, and really, because AI is so powerful that you want to make sure that whoever they're talking to, that they make a commitment to doing it in the right way, the sustainable way. How does that apply to finance. Right. So the problem is there's so many different aspects of what correct means, yeah. right? So if we think about AI, where, it, where it's going to be deployed, right? It's not just, you know, it's understanding credit risk and reaching more of the population in ways that, that biases are hindering. So that's great. There's also targeting and marketing. There's monitoring. There's chatbots to get information, authenticating fraud, right? All these sort of uses. Along the other side, though, we have to think about things like there's been research that finds that AI teaches itself it, itself how to collude, mm-hmm. right, which is, right. has all kinds of – your mind gets goes crazy when you start thinking about that, and then AI can be deceptive in conveyance to get right. an outcome at once. So this is a sequel to The Matrix 2 or something? <laughs> I mean, really, that's what – Reeve shows up, right? Right. Paul can play Reese. I can't <laughs> play Reese. Come on. Most of the public is scared stiff of this. Let's begin with a timeline. Are you looking out to 2030 or are you looking out to 2040? Or 2025, right? I mean, AI is already being used. Are we ready for this? We are, we're not ready, nor are the providers ready, right? The providers themselves are concerned about the you know there's startups left and right right and what are the startups doing and what inputs are we using do we let ai go on all the data that's available about someone to profile okay, them? but do you fly into park avenue and you're going to talk to james diamond and his team at jp morgan you're going to bring ike and green of of berkeley along just to impress everybody and they're going to go we need to trust this process what's the trust factor at this conference in boston do people trust ai i think I, I don't I don't know the answer. Do they trust? I don't think they know one way or the other. I think where we are is that right now, if we understand what inputs AI is using, so you can control that, right? Where, where it's going, what information it's using to make decisions. Um, if you control the inputs, you're able to put a bound on what it can do, right? You can tell it not to lie. You can tell it only to use these da- these certain inputs that are non-discriminatory. Um, and other things. Right now, what the, how that input use is getting deployed is a black box. 
how, from your research, talking to providers of credit, how are they using AI yet? Are they using AI, or is it still the loan officer that I got to convince I'm, I'm a good credit? No, no, definitely they are using AI, okay. right? I mean, from the you know the simple way, the chatbots, right? G- getting information in, right? That that is, those are AI driven, but also the processing and understanding. Um, under general parameters, right? Under, you know, how would you maximize for, for profitably lending or how would you for profitably marketing new new products to people, right? They are using their, are they deploying underwriting um, at a full scale using AI yet? No, probably not. There are some exceptions to that, but, but we're, we're using it little bits here and there and it, pretty soon the, the whole arena changes. Is America behind on this, or are we leading the way? Uh, probably leading. Leading is not, you know, the, the, there are other countries that are also deploying. China's deploying. There's, there's a whole movement in, in Europe and, and a law in Europe regarding some of these things. And so it's, we are ahead, but we are with others in that, that lead. So, Paul, I got a credit rating yeah. of 100. It's like so low. You know, they don't even talk to me. And I get emails all the time. We'll give you 45000 We'll give you 10000 sure. Is that AI-driven? Is it your fault? <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. But I, but that's where we are, right? That's where we, you know, there there are people that are, you know, they have credit scores that maybe those credit scores are not right. And maybe AI helps, right? Um, and, and so, and then there are other people that, you know. All right, well, here's my concern is that small community banks, they're not going to be able to make the technology investments. Therefore, the, whatever benefits may be out there, and I don't know if there are, by, by the way, you have to convince me, um, I'm, I'm afraid that they're not going to have the same capabilities as, say, a J.P. Morgan Chase. So I'm, I'm a big fan of having a community financial architecture, banks, the lenders, the CDFIs, right? And the reason it's so important is because in downturns, these the research shows that the, these these local community facing lenders and banks they they're able to stick with their customers in, in when they need them the most um, so so far technology has not replicated that now whether AI becomes a localized lender because its ability to act local is a question we don't know um, and how what does that mean for the for the financial architecture of the United States is a complete unknown so I mean at the end of the day if I'm <clears throat> providing credit I want just I want to Good credit environment where I get paid back, where I'm able to diverse, you know, distribute, you know, debt into my marketplace. But I want to get paid back. I don't want to take undue credit risk. Ideally, AI will help me do that better. I ideally it will help you do that better, and also to to manage new products and new services for customers to figure out where they they might be exposed right. to risk or where they might be evolving in their business okay. or household. A Thirty second question. We don't have enough time. It's unfair. Type one, type two construct. Is AI in banking going to help banks or help them not lose money? It's going to help them grow their business. Type one. That's kind of what they want to. Business. That's what they want to hear. Adair Morse, thank you so much for joining us. Adair Morse, she's a professor of finance at the University of California at Berkeley. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live each weekday, 7 to 10 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.